My name is Gabra Zachman. I am an audiobook narrator, actress, director, and coach. I'm absolutely thrilled to welcome you all here tonight. And as I'm seeing people come in, I'm just so excited about how many people are here. Um, it shows me how many people like myself deeply need this seminar tonight. Um, before we have our guests speak today, and I'm, I'll be moderating just so you all know, uh, I wanna let you know that the SAG-AFTRA Foundation is a nonprofit organization that relies entirely on donations to provide emergency assistance and free educational programs to SAG-AFTRA artists. This conversation is made possible thanks to the generosity of our supporters. Over the past year, the foundation has given over $6.5 million in COVID relief to more than 7,000 performers. If you are a SAG-AFTRA artist and need help, please ask. And if you can help, please give. In for, please give. Uh, information can be found in the description of this video, meaning in the description of the evening. Thank you for your support. Now, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Melissa Tears, Suzanne Torin, and Peter Pamela Rose. Each of these extraordinary artists will speak for about five minutes. They're gonna tell you where they come from, a little bit about what their practice is, what they're about, and then we're gonna have time for some questions. Um, I will uh, throw some questions. I have a million questions myself, but you're welcome. I'll tell you when to start putting questions in the chat after all of them introduce themselves. And then I will field the questions and make sure that we get to as many of them as we possibly can tonight. Um, stage fright is something that nearly all performers deal with at one time or another. And we've invited these professionals to impart some wisdom on what tools they have that might help. Um, I wanted to speak for myself personally. I, I feel like I've dealt with far more fear since the during the pandemic and mm -hmm. since the pandemic in this in-between time than I have before. <clears throat> I have the privilege of this week, and this is um, amazing synchronicity. I'm doing a workshop this week of a new Kate Hamill play. For anyone who knows her work, she's also a dear friend. It's been fabulous. And then my theater company is doing a reading in person for the first time um, in back in our old space on the weekend. And leading into this workshop this week, I was filled with fear and I thought it was just me. And then um, everyone, everyone came in and was like, did you sleep last night? I didn't sleep last night. Did you sleep last night? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, actor behavior, but I, I just wonder if everyone who's joined on this call is feeling that in every aspect of your life, you are feeling considerably more fear and anxiety um, and maybe stuck in some ways. I know that I am, which is why I'm excited to moderate tonight. So um, I'm gonna turn this over to these women and uh, I might ask a question and then I'm gonna turn the questions over to you. So without further ado, uh, how would we like to start? Peter, would you like to start? Oh, is it just a few minutes? I thought Melissa was starting. I know, I just, I, I just thought I was, gonna right. throw, I was gonna like juggle it around a little bit to see how, sure. how scared I could make the guests tonight. Wow, okay. Well, um, just something I, I, so hi everyone. I am Peter Pamela Rose. I am a certified uh, professional coach. I am a life and career coach and my company is actingbusinessbootcamp.com. Uh, I actually have my assistant, Jonathan Lavelle. He's going to uh, put in my email address and my uh, website. So if you have any questions, you can certainly uh, contact me. The The thing that I just, I have to jump on uh, that Gabra so beautifully put is, is that, you know, we've all never been in a global pandemic before. And I think the reason why we're dealing with more anxiety than ever is, is because we also have never opened up after a global pandemic before. So I just wanted to kind of put that into some kind of perspective there. Um, so a little bit about me. Yes, I am a certified life and career coach. I am also, though, an active casting director. I have a company with my husband called The Looping Division. Uh, I cast uh, background voices and specific voices for uh, film and television, which is also known as Loop Group. Um, in addition to that, I also, it's funny, this part I have to read because my resume I can't remember, but the other stuff I'm going to tell you that I can. Um, we cast uh, over or 10 shows a year, which is about 100 SAG after a day player contracts. Um, and we also do casting consulting for agents, managers, and other film and TV and voiceover projects. So that's kind of my background as a casting director. And I spoke to Gabra and I said, if anyone has 
questions about anxiety and fear from the casting point of view, I'm more than happy to answer that for you. Um, as I said, I am a certified life and career coach. Uh, I did a nine month training program uh, at IPEC. Um, in, I've kind of added up all of my education. I, because I take my coaching very seriously and I take the subject of anxiety very seriously, which you will hear soon in a moment. Um, I have spent over $20,000 on my own education so that I can best guide actors in their own issues in career and in life. Um, and then finally, I have actually worked as an actress for over 30 years. I know you're all shocked. You're like, oh my God, she started as a baby. Um, and uh, I am fully vested in SAG-AFTRA um, and have just been working basically um, ever since I was a teenager. Um, so that's all, you know, fine and good, but we're here to talk about anxiety and I'm gonna try and keep this to under five minutes. So I wanna tell you my personal story with anxiety. Um, I was born with, the only way I can describe it is like an affliction. Um, from the time I was about three and a half, uh, I started to experience horrific panic attacks. Um, my mom and I have kind of gone back and kind of looked at when that was. And for me, what a panic attack means is I start to shake, like my body starts to shake uncontrollably. I start to sweat. Um, my mouth gets very dry. And when it gets extreme, um, I know TMI, I start vomiting and I have horrific diarrhea. And that for me is what a panic attack is like. Um, I met a really good friend of mine uh, when I heard him speak about anxiety. He said, if someone puts a gun to my head and he says, I might shoot you or I might not, and my other choice is the panic attack, I'm gonna choose the guy with the gun. And I feel like it's people who really suffered with anxiety that understand that when that panic is so gripping, it's like, I'll choose potential death over having to go through the next few minutes because it's so crippling and so debilitating. So when I was eight years old, um, I had already been suffering quite a bit with this. Every single night around five o'clock, I would have what I would call anticipatory anxiety attacks. Um, like I would worry that I would have an anxiety attack. And that was very frightening because I was just a very young child. And when I was eight years old, I auditioned for the class play and I got the lead because um, I had a big voice. I still do, but I had a really big voice back then. And um, I noticed that the nights that we did the show those were the only nights when I didn't have an anticipatory panic attack. And those were the only nights when I would not be paralyzed with fear. So very quickly, I decided what I was going to do for the rest of my life. So fast forward, um, one of the things as a uh, life and career coach for actors is, is that I have five years of conservatory training. I went to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts in New York and immediately went to the Guildhall School of Music and Drama in London right after. So I had actually started working as an actress and was a union member um, before I actually went into these schools. And um, when I went to Guildhall, the best way I can describe it is the shit hit the fan. I was doing the role of Mrs. Cheevely in uh, An Ideal Husband on the main stage at Guildhall, the widest stage in Europe, just a little fact. And um, I proceeded to have a panic attack right in the middle of the play. And uh, under my costume, my knees started to go like this. That's the only way I can describe what happened. And when I finished the performance, I said to myself, I'm going to finish this performance. I'm going to finish out my year at Guildhall, and I am never getting on the stage again. Never. I will not get on the stage. There's no way in hell. I'll do film. I'll do television. I'll do commercials. I'll do voiceovers. I am not getting on the stage again. So I graduate from Guildhall, go back to the United States, and my agent at the time, uh, of course, what does he send his blonde ingenue who just graduated from British drama school to, he sends her out on theater auditions. And I kept getting, I was like the callback queen. I kept getting callback after callback after callback. And I said to myself, oh my God, one of these days, I'm going to book one of these fuckers. And then what the hell am I going to do? And I'm sorry, I swear a lot. I'll try and keep it clean. Anyway, so my agent calls me uh, one fateful day and says, Peter, you just booked Sybil in Private Lives at the Cincinnati Playhouse in the park. This is fantastic. It's amazing. You're going to get your equity card. It's $800 a week. Oh, my God. Isn't this great? Silence on the other end of the line. 
And I was like, oh my God, what am I going to do? I, I, I can't get on the stage again. So I had just started really doing the work that I will be talking about later today, and we all will be talking about later today. And I kind of somehow got brave and went to Cincinnati and rehearsed it and had such a wonderful time. And it was the night before, the night before our first performance. And I remember this like it was yesterday. I sat in my little one bedroom apartment and I looked in the mirror and I looked deep into my eyes and I said, kiddo, this is it. This is it. You have got two choices. You can do this or you can run back to New York with your tail between your legs and you are not. But I'd heard a Helen Keller quote that said to keep our faces towards change and behave like a free spirit in the presence of fate is strength undefeatable. And what that meant to me was that if I performed this role like the actress that I was to the ability I knew I had in me to do, I would achieve a strength that was undefeatable. And that's what I did. Now, to conclude, I actually just taught you a little something here, which is find your strength story. Find your strength story, because when the poop hits the fan, it's those moments you're going to want to go back to. So that's just a little bit about me. I had a sense that you might start us out well, and boy, was I right. Um, that was remarkable. Thank you for being so candid. And I just wish, I know everyone on here wishes that every casting director had the level of compassion and understanding that you have. Mm. Um, I do have, I'm going to do just a couple little questions as we go along. We're going to do this in a slightly different way than we had initially said, just because a couple of people put questions in. So quick question for you, if you don't mind, which is, do you still have panic attacks? Not really. No. Amazing. Um, it, uh, I mean, I'm not going to tell you no unequivocally. Um, my biggest fear right now mm. is my parents are 82 and, mm. um, I kind of was thinking the other day as preparing for this, like, what is the thing that would give me fear? And mm -hmm. hearing that they had been hurt or they had died. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I also have to say that as a coach, I am not afraid to show my emotions to you um, yeah. because as you can see, I'm tearing up because I think it's important that I think that one of the things that has gotten me through being someone who was so filled with so much panic is, is that I allow my emotions to just be. I'd be a really mm. great actress on camera now if I actually did it, but I have no desire <laughs> anymore. <laughs> but the <laughs> fact of the matter is, is that I feel that my emotional, um, my ability to feel my emotions without fear, including mm. anxiety, is what uh, is, has helped me to get through it. And also for me, I'm one of those people that as soon as something happens um, that, that causes anxiety in me, I stop eating immediately. That's my mm -hmm. MO, mm -hmm. I stop eating. So what I need to do is when I start to get panicked, I literally set a, a timer on my phone. And because I know that that is my, it's my crutch, it's my thing that I go to. And I'm, I, I, I have learned how I work. So mm. I understand me and I am now my own best friend, whereas I used to be my own worst enemy. Mm. And, and I think another thing was really learning that I am strong and I am capable and I can handle it. Mm. Whereas what I used to tell myself was always that I was stupid and incapable. And I don't mm. believe I'm stupid and incapable at all. I actually think I'm incredibly capable and I'm incredibly strong. And I feel that that's been a long, intense journey. Uh, I also mm -hmm. need to just say it's this is I have been doing this work for over 26 years. So it's mm. not like, yeah, I don't want anyone to think, oh, she did this overnight. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Anything but. Right. Oh, how beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was extremely gracious and um, really a helpful way to begin here. Um, Melissa, may we move on to you, please? And sure. um, there's no, you know, we would love to know just a little bit about your background. And I'm, I'm fascinated personally by what you do. So I'm just interested to hear a little bit more about it. And then there's a couple of questions I might throw your way as well. All right, cool. Um, I'm a hypnotist here in New York City. Well, now 
with Zoom everywhere. I'm a hypnotist everywhere. Uh, <laughs> but I had a center in Chelsea for, for many years, and I've been doing um, this work for over 20, about 23 years now. Um, anxiety is one of my specialties, uh, fears of all kinds. So, um, you know, the way that I work is, is it's, it's kind of a combination of teaching people how to, you know, rewire the kind of habituated fear uh, loop that they, you know, we all kind of do our things slightly differently as Peter just said, you know, her, her form of panic attacks are hardcore. That's, you know, so there's a broad range of, of, of you know, panic, uh, anxiety, and fears. And, you know, we tend to lump them all together, but obviously they have major differences. But subjectively speaking, you know, it's debilitating regardless of how yours shows up. So part of what I do is I, I kind of um, work with individuals to kind of tease out their own particular uh, anxiety strategy, and then we thwart it, right? So I teach a bunch of really rapid hypnotic techniques to get the hell out of anxiety so that like all of my clients kind of are armed, you know, like that's the first thing. How do I arm this person with five different ways to stop a panic attack, right? Like that. But more importantly, knowing that each time they stop it, they're kind of interrupting the loop. It forces their brain to fire differently. So you're starting to rewire the brain with each and every pattern interrupt. So the first level of my work is to, you know, give people different ways to stop it. Right. And whether that's the fear, whether that fear takes the form of the internal dialogue, if their strategy is, you know, they've got the internal dialogue running, then I've got five different ways to bust out of that, to transform it, to make it, you know, work for them instead of against them. Everybody kind of does it differently. Then the second layer is to kind of recondition how they want to feel instead, which is the other part of neuroplasticity, right? Showing the brain how to show up. Right. And then and then kind of going into hypnosis and kind of conditioning it in. Right. So I work with a lot of actors. I'm certainly not like Peter. It's not my specialty at all. But um, over the over the years being in New York, I've had my fair share. <laughs> and a lot of it is, you know, at one point I, I, I taught a whole group uh, just to kind of, you know, nail auditions you know, and just kind of reframing the audition process as, you know, in New York, getting a, a free acting class in front of, you know, people that will give you feedback, <laughs> you know, like you don't have to pay for it, but certainly just kind of giving, teaching everybody um, different forms of self-hypnosis so that whether that's combating however that fear shows up for you, or it's just overcoming, you know, Peter said something very interesting, which was on the nights that she um, was, you know, rehearsing or, or doing the show, she number one, didn't have anticipatory anxiety, but also didn't have the panic attack. And part of what I've been kind of shouting from the rooftops all these years is that anxiety is a form of hypnosis in that you go into a highly suggestible state, right? Once you know the mechanism of fight or flight, the mechanism in, in the brain and, and the nervous system in general, and how that kind of the rational thinking conscious mind really gets shoved aside because your, your unconscious mind is trying to protect you, right? They're dropping flags. Somewhere along the line, that is deemed as a threat and your brain's job is to protect you. So, you know, that's what's happening. But when you can start to, you know, twist it a little bit and, you know, and, and Peter just, it, I love that you said that because without the anticipatory anxiety, which does act like a hypnotic loop, which then kind of tells the body this is happening and the body responds. You know, I, I talk about anxiety as a hypnotic state because people do become highly suggestible to their own internal dialogue as well, right? So what you then think to yourself becomes like a hypnotic suggestion. So people will often say things like, 
you know, or they'll think it, I can't breathe. And when you're in an open, suggestible state and you've just told your unconscious mind you can't breathe, your unconscious mind tries to protect you by overbreathing, right? Hyperventilation <laughs> because it's trying to reach for more air, right? So there's many ways that you can track it. And I've, I've studied the, the different forms of how, you know, how, how people do their particular form of anxiety and you can track the trance. And once you can do that, you can interject and segue out of it. What I thought that I would do um, that's more useful since I'm not an actor. Um, I used to be a rock and roll musician, but so I, I've had my share of performing, uh, but you know, uh, it's, it's a little bit different. Um, what I thought I would do is just share some really quick, you know, like few minute rather than just tell, you know, giving you more about me or whatever, just throw out some useful things that I think everybody should know. That's exactly what someone just asked for in the, I'm keeping my eye, just so you all know, I'm keeping my eye on all the questions. I'm going to try to ferret them to the right people, but I have two things for you. And the very first one I would like to throw your way is exactly what you're already doing, which is some simple techniques to counteract yeah. that. I also yeah. want you to know how many people in here, including myself, are really wowed by the idea of anxiety being like a, a hypnotic state of its own. Mm -hmm. uh, someone yeah, else, someone I mean, who struggles with a lot of it. Thank you for that. You've just really blown my mind already. But that well, idea of one like, of the things that, that things. just to go along with that that we don't necessarily understand unless you study, you know, language and cognition is is how you know, negation has a slower processing time in the brain. So when people are trying to calm down, but they're saying things like, I'm not going to panic, I'm not going to panic, I'm not going to panic, all the unconscious mind hears is panic, right? It's, you know, don't think of a blue elephant, that same kind of syndrome, right? You have to think blue elephant and then negate because it's a kind of a, a it's a linguistic construction, um, oftentimes negation. And so just learn, just thinking of it as a hypnotic state, you start to modify the way you speak to yourself, right? Instead of, you know, I'm not going to freak out. I'm not going to freak out. It's, you know, rather I'm going to relax or I'm going to calm or I'm excited. Quite often, instead of going from anxiety to, I've got many ways to downregulate the vagus nerve, you know, the, the nervous system and, and, and to rapidly rebalance the brain, sometimes just taking that anxiety and spinning it into excitement, right? Because I've worked with, you know, opera singers, I've worked with people that when they describe the excitement they feel, it is the exact description of another person's anxiety and stage fright, they're discussing the same symptoms. One is interpreting it as, anxi as, as anxiety and another is interpreting it as excitement. And those two are so close that you can easily lean into one rather than the other. One little trick, um, you've probably heard different breathing exercises where you take a deep breath in and you exhale twice as long, right? The exhaling twice as long down regulates the nervous system. So you naturally start to slow down the brainwave and you, you kind of entrain the, it's, it's, if, if you want to look it up, it's interesting stuff, the, the vagus nerve to down regulate through the elongated exhale. Sometimes I've worked with um, actors to revamp the first few lines to see if they can make it one sentence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this way, you're actually doing that down regulation by speaking, right? So instead of, you know, even people that, because I work with a lot of public speaking, that's, you know, that's a big deal in, in my world. And so just instead of saying hi, you know, or my name is this, and then they're going to continue talking. Just, hey, everybody, how's it going? I'm so excited to be here. You know, is everyone, and you're running out of air, that down regulates the nervous system. So just a little tidbit you might want to play with. So here's the first little technique that um, has been one of my personal mantras for, you know, this whole pandemic, well, through the whole presidency of, well, anyway, for five, six years, let's just say my personal mantra is for me personally to shift out, which I'm about to teach you 
and shut up, right? It's just because the internal dialogue starts looping. And without internal dialogue, it's really hard to keep anxiety going. It's almost impossible. So we have 90 seconds of a duration. 90 seconds is the time it takes an emotion to wash through the system, the biochemicals of it, the hormones of it, the energetics of it. It's 90 seconds. But how can we be anxious for an hour? Well, as soon as we do the 90 seconds, before it goes away, we talk to ourselves. Oh, my God, I'm really freaking out. (laughs) How dare that person say this to me? You know, and we just keep hitting the 90 second beep. So there's many things that I show people how to kind of deal with and segue out of the 90 seconds. And this is one. So everybody just take a moment and find a focal point. And as you find that focal point, just noticing the details of whatever that point is, that's using your foveal vision. Without moving your eyes, begin becoming aware of your peripheral field. So without moving your eyes, be aware of the walls on either side of you, as if you could reach visually beyond the walls, almost as if you could reach for all that space behind you. And then bring it back into focus. What was that like? What was that like, Abra? Uh, uh, this is an interesting answer. In addition to it just being very relaxing, my hearing changed. <laughs> um, <laughs> right? I just like, because I was suddenly like, why am I now here? It was like, you know, the expansive of, of one. Yeah. It didn't, it, it turned into hearing somehow that it, it, everything went out a little bit more so, outside of me. So the reason, the reason that relaxation is just a natural part of this is because by shifting into peripheral vision, you start to shift into the parasympathetic nervous system or rather the relaxation response. But more importantly, you tend to shut up. And when you shut up inside your head, that's foreign for a lot of people. Certainly, I almost never shut up inside my head. It's just my ongoing internal narration that that is how I do life. Um, So this initially felt very foreign to me and weird. So a lot of times I'll be teaching this to people and I'll see them almost like, whoa, kind of sway with it. You know, I've teach this to people with OCD. I work with um, in conjunction with a lot of psychiatrists. That's primarily what I do is train uh, therapists and psychiatrists in 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 my work. And so I get a chance to play with a lot of interesting minds because uh, we work with their patients. And I'll tell you, sometimes just doing this one will stop a panic attack for a lot of people with OCD. So it's a very interesting, easy to do thing. Practice it. And when you do it a second time, let's just take a moment, do it a second time where you focus in and then you shift into peripheral. What'll start to happen when you practice this is you don't need the original focus. You can do this walking down the street. You can do this on stage. You can do this anywhere. And I can continue to speak from this place. Once you get more comfortable with it, people won't even know you're doing something. So it's kind of covert. And then bring it back in. Got it? Now, here's another real quickie. If everybody can grab something, whatever, you know, your, a pen, glasses, water bottle, and I want to show you something. And for this, I am going to ask you, because it's, it's going to be kind of ridiculous if you look at this and you don't actually feel what it feels like to stop anxiety with this. So I am going to um, ask everyone to take a little bit and take a moment and kind of think of like you getting onto stage and kind of feeling a little bit of that stage fright or a lot or however much you want to, you know, gather. And I'll give you a second to kind of conjure it up. I know actors are pretty quick when it comes to being able to access these emotions kind of, right? So take a moment and now everybody follow me. So I am simply passing this back and forth from the center of the body. If everyone would do this, 
actually physically do it. Good. So I'm not throwing and catching because I'm not that coordinated. What I'm doing is crossing the midline of the body. Now, the reason this works is because anxiety tends to be an overactivation of one hemisphere. Now you're using the whole brain, but this overactivation plays out in a bunch of different ways. And what we're doing now is we're stimulating right brain, left brain, right brain, left brain, by starting to flood both hemispheres with activity, um, that anxiety circuit can't keep its shit together. So this is just bilateral stimulation. It's kind of at the core of things like EMDR and binaural beats and hemispheric synchronization uh, tapes, but it's that simple. Now I've watched this not only stop a panic attack dead in its tracks, but an asthma attack as well, which is kind of interesting. Nice. So now stop and just take a moment and notice what you're feeling. Suzanne, since we can talk, <laughs> what was that like for you? Oh, it was fabulous. Thank you so much. Everything that you're talking about, neuroplasticity, um, is directly connected to the work I do as a Feldenkrais teacher. Ah, uh, yes. So, so it was really uh, to, to have these little, uh, these goodies, you know, crossing the midline yes. as being a, an anxiety interrupter and an asthma interrupter. Yay. Yes. And, and cravings, by the way, cravings seem really? to act almost like anxiety in the brain because almost all, and I've just been, you know, doing my own little tests. I have a big student group. So they're my guinea pigs for the things I'm working on. Um, and I found that this stops a craving, whether that craving is for cigarettes or chocolate or, cause I also work with a lot of addicts um, and I have an addictions protocol. Um, and so these are really useful pattern interrupts. Um, and I'm a big fan of, of, of what you do because that is another route. You know, it's, it's a big embodied route that most people don't think of that when they think of neuroplasticity, but it's a big one. You know, we think of it as like some cognitive thing when really it's fully embodied, you that know? Is, that is awesome. Thank you so much. Sure. That meant a very great deal to me. And I, I appreciate, I feel like you just made a, an inroad to Suzanne. So I'm just mm -hmm. going to move it. Over to Susan. I, I do have like a page of questions at this point. So. Okay. <laughs> Suzanne, uh, Suzanne yeah. one, of my, one of my great personal mentors, as well as dear friends, <laughs> would you mind just giving us a little bit? And then I, you, I actually Sandra. would love to shoot a couple of questions to you once you've given us a little sure. bit about who you are. Sure. So thank you, Melissa. Uh, and thank you, Peter, also. But Melissa, as, uh, as a segue into neuroplasticity, because the Feldenkrais method, which I'm a teacher of and have been for 30 years, um, deals uh, precisely with this retraining the brain, reorganizing the, the system, uh, learning how to do other things than what we have been habituated to do uh, through either <clears throat> just our culture or through stuff that we're told at home or at school, what's acceptable behavior, what's not acceptable behavior. And so we, we limit um, the potential range of, of things human beings can do with their bodies. It's not that everybody can become Nureyev or everybody can become, you know, uh, uh, the greatest basketball player in the world, but, but that we all have a larger range of movement capacity and of thinking capacity than we are normally, uh, than we normally uh, access. Just really quickly, one sentence <clears throat> about me. I'm an actor first and a uh, uh, audiobook narrator. I found a, a niche, fortunately and deliciously, a niche in audiobooks. And I've been doing uh, that for many decades. And um, I'm, I also, 30 years ago, became a Feldenkrais uh, teacher. And my, uh, what you said, Melissa, I'm looking at my notes here, about um, uh, anxiety being like a hypnotic state, an open and receptive state, if I understood you. Well, here's our predicament, actors. What we do, what all acting schools are about is how to get the actor into an open and receptive state. Uh, for me, uh, uh, one, there are two ways to, to approach anxiety, like, like I was just thinking specifically of um, before you go on stage or before you go into an audition. 
Mm-hmm. Before you go on stage is really where I'm, my attention is. Um, and often one of the things that I do, a physical thing that I can think of that's sort of a Feldenkrais move, is if you just sit in it, if you sit or stand, however you like, but if many of you are sitting in a chair, you can try it now. Sit in the chair close to the forward edge of the chair. If the chair is hard rather than soft, it might be better, but in any case, feel your sit bones on the chair. If you don't know where your sit bones are, take your own hands and put them under your butt and you will feel a bony part under all the flesh and under all the fat and under all the everything. There's still a bony part uh, of, it's actually the bottom of the pelvis that you will feel and feel those places and you can, you can just take your hands away once you felt them, so that you can feel yourself sitting on your sit bones. Most of us, by the way, tend to sit behind our sit bones because chairs are presumably made more comfortable by forcing us to lean back, which is Mm -hmm. bullshit. Uh, Mm -hmm. It's not good for us at all. But anyway, that's a separate issue. So if you sit on your sit bones and feel your feet on the floor, you're having four points of contact of kind of grounding. And then if you do some breathing, um, as Melissa started to say, there are many different ways to breathe. One, one thing I learned recently is that both breathing, inhale and inhaling and exhaling through the nose is, uh, is a relaxing, a more relaxing situation than inhaling and then breathing out through your mouth or even breathing out with a sort of kind of thing, which in many disciplines, that's the way you breathe. But from the Feldenkrais point of view, if you breathe out with your mouth pursed, you're already creating tension around your lips, which isn't just your lips, it's your cheeks, which isn't just your cheeks, it's around the muscles of your eyes, etc. So the simplest, most neutral way is to inhale through your nose and exhale through your nose and just see if at a certain point it might be available, it might become spontaneously true that the exhale is longer than the inhale. Another way to to, uh, physicalize the breathing is to put your hands on your sternum and feel as you inhale, maybe the, the sternum, the breastbone moves out a little bit, out and up a little bit. It, we're talking about a little bit, we're not talking miles, but you can feel the movement under your hands as you inhale. And you can put one hand on your belly too and feel that maybe you inhale and at one point your uh, breastbone gets fuller and at another point your belly gets fuller. And then you exhale and feel the sinking of the belly and the chest. So it's just another way to have your hands, one on your belly, one on your chest, to have your hands there as kind of markers uh, so that it's not just about breathing and sort of spacing out. Um, There's one other thing that's really, I haven't really tried this much, but I invite you to try it. It's it's a simple thing and and the recommendation, it was highly recommended. Take your two hands, hold them up like this in front of you, and then cross your thumbs one over the other. Doesn't matter which one goes on top or which one on bottom. And then take the fingers of your left hand and curl them around the right thumb and take the fingers of the right hand and curl them around the left thumb. So now you're holding your thumbs and the pad of the thumb is more or less at the the base of the middle finger, more or less, right? And just put these interlaced thumbs, put this, this arrangement on your lap and just sit quietly, breathing, inhale, exhale through your nose. And at some point, I'm going really fast here because there's not much time, but at some point, do a movement of as you inhale, let me do this, as you inhale, flex your wrists a little bit. And as you exhale, put your uh, hands back in your lap. So I'm lifting my hands up to show you, but really you aren't lifting your hands up out of your lap. Your hands remain in your lap. 
And at some point, as you inhale, you flex your wrists a little back and exhale and let your hands go down to your lap. Do it for a few minutes. It's supposed to be fantastic. Uh, um, again, for the, for the same reason, Melissa, I think, that it just slows the nervous system down. When you really, all of the Feldenkrais work is, is slows the nervous system down because you start to pay very close attention to the movements of your body. You're directed to pay attention to, I don't know, your shoulder, your, your head, your pelvis, your leg, whatever. But the fact of paying that attention slows the system down. Um, there's one other thing I'd like to say. Uh, for actors, and then we can open it up. Um, uh, Moshe Feldenkrais, who developed this method, um, uh, taught a bunch of classes to Peter Brook's company many years ago. Peter Brook, the, the British uh, director, genius director. And uh, so he was doing the lessons, and many, most of the lessons in the Feldenkrais work are done. You lie on the floor and you and you do various movements starting on the floor. And one of the actresses in Peter Brook's company, I can't remember who, but it was a famous name. And she said, wait a minute, before I go on stage, I don't wanna be lying on the floor. I wanna be up, I wanna be moving. And that's a good point. So <laughs> there's, there's a way that you can be active and, and relaxed at the same time. Relaxed isn't even the right word. Relaxed is what you do before you go to sleep. Att attentive and, and present without anxiety. In addition to, um, yes, relaxing the voice. That was one question I just saw that I thought you'd be good for. But I also wouldn't mind if you would answer a couple of people, one who I believe is an older gentleman and one who perhaps is not, um, a, a, a woman who's, I don't know how old she is, but people have talked about the idea of lines of when they get into the trying to memorize lines, if a line then gets forgotten, getting stuck in a feedback loop of I can't do it now, or I now I've forgotten it. Now I can't. What happens? Do you ever have that happen yourself when you're on stage? And how do you deal with it when you get in that place? And and do things, let's be really candid, do things change as we get older? Do those <laughs> capacities change? It's definitely been my experience that that uh the process of learning lines has changed. Um, yeah. I, I relatively recently, a few years ago, when I had a lot to learn in a short time, I had a friend of mine uh, help me and she had some good ideas for mnemonic techniques, you know, so she noticed that uh, uh, if there were three adjectives, they all began with the same letter or something, she would say, so remember that, you know, stuff I didn't notice. So, so those kinds of things are useful. Um, the thing that I mostly find ab um, worrying about forgetting lines is just feeling as prepared as I can beforehand, as prepared as I can before I'm on stage. So I might go over the piece, my lines, two or three times. I'll, pr I'll practice uh, during the day. I mean, I'll practice saying them fast. I'll practice saying them slow. I'll practice saying them in a high voice. I'll practice saying them in the low voice, just turning it all around, playing in all these different ways so that eventually when you're there, something spontaneous can come up. And if you forget a line, you forget a line. If you know where the piece is going or where the, where the movement is going in a monologue, I'm thinking, you can just pick it up and probably nobody will notice. So uh, I put together uh, this um a freebie. It's a PDF called How to Own Your Power as an Actor. And it kind of comes again from my coaching point of view, but also from my casting point of view. Um, and so Jonathan will put my email. If you're interested, just shoot me an email. I'll get it to you. I think we're going to try and get it on the website. But I just, you know what, it's not going to work. So I wrote it here. I just want to also <laughs> that, that um, idea of you get a thought in your head and it just starts to repeat. And uh, this is uh, how I got out of the thoughts of I am not enough or I'm not talented enough or, oh, my God, I'm going to screw this up or et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going to do my best to kind of show it here. You're going to get a little bit of my ring light. 
So mm-hmm. over here, I have something happens. And what happens is I react. Okay. So let's just talk about that for a moment. So I get the thought, oh my God, I'm not good enough. Or you're sitting in the waiting room. Remember when we used to do that? You're mm-hmm. sitting in the waiting room and all of a sudden you give the part to the person, the actor sitting over there because, oh my God, they mm-hmm. look so much more like the part than you do, right? Mm-hmm. And the whole thing is, is that something happens and then you react. And then I want to bring you over to my little triangle over here, which is that is the thought. That thought then leads you to an, to an emotion. And that emotion is you don't feel that great about yourself, okay? You're just like, I suck basically. And then you go into the action, which is you go into that audition. And then of course you bomb it. Well, I shouldn't say of course, but chances are with all this negative, Mm -hmm. uh, what I call, and I talk about this in the handout uh, with all the catabolic energy going on, you're, you have a low chance for success. And then the thought goes there. And then it's like, see, you're not that good. You're not that talented. So that goes into you feeling bad. That goes into your action. That goes into your thoughts. So that's kind of like explaining it very quickly. Uh, again, it's much neater in the handout. Um, but what I want to turn your attention to and what I want to teach you is the what I call the other side, which is something happens. And that thing that happens is, is that I think I am not enough. Then I react because this is uh, one of my phrases. I'm not responsible for my first thought, but I am responsible for my second. I'm not responsible for my first thought, but I am responsible for my second. So then what I need to do is I need to tell myself stop. And for me, it's sometimes like stop, 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 stop. And when I stop, I then want to take a step back. So if you would all uh, um, indulge me, although my hand is kind of some black uh, marker on it, I want you to put your hand in front of your face. It's really simple. Just put your hand in front of your face. And what you're going to notice is you can't see your hand that well. Well, this is what it's like when anxiety is upon you. (laughs) It It is swallowing you. But now remove your hand a foot away from your Uh, away from you. And I go, oh, look, I'm wearing a wedding band. I must be married. You know, things like you you Mm. can observe. Mm. So if Mm. you take that step back and then it puts you in a place where you can observe and you can observe that thought, you use your mind to govern your brain, to observe the thought. The thought is, is this healthy for me or is this unhealthy Mm. for me? I am Mm. not good enough. Well, that is not a healthy thought for me. That is a catabolic thought for me. So then I can respond. And one of my quotes that I, I made up is a response is a reaction with a thought and a pause behind it. Now, that whole process that probably was almost impossible to write down, but <laughs> because we were doing going through it so quickly, but that whole process is something that when I was getting over my anxiety, that I would go through 500 times a day. And it was funny because I would wake up in the morning and I would go, oh God, another day of changing my thoughts. Because it, it's an <laughs> exhausting process because what you are doing is you are changing, you're rewiring, as uh, Melissa said, you're rewiring your mind. Now, the only reason why this works, and this is my whole thing, is I never give anybody any any tools, any training that I have not guinea pigged on my own anxiety. And my anxiety, as Melissa, thank you for validating me, Melissa, was quite extreme. And so, and today I don't think things like I am not good enough. That thought doesn't even cross my mind anymore. And yet that Mm. was a thought or that I'm not capable or I can't handle it. Because for me, what I started to learn was anxiety is about handling it. Mm. Anxiety is about taking responsibility. What am I not taking responsibility for in this moment? So from a casting point of view, As a casting director, and this is going to be because you heard my story, right? Mm. So that's me, Peter, the coach. That's me, Peter, the woman, the person. That's me. 
As a casting director, I cannot hire any actor that I think will melt in mm. the room. And that's tough because I also have tremendous compassion for what that actor is going through. Mm. But my job is on the line. Mm. And when my job is on the line, I am so sorry. I'm going to take care of myself first. Take care of yourself first and the rest will follow. See, I switched that from casting director to coach really quickly. <laughs> the, um, I have a weekly podcast, uh, the Acting Business Bootcamp podcast, and it was Judy Henderson. It's an upcoming episode. It hasn't been published yet. Um, and you can get it on Apple Podcasts where Judy, Judy Henderson talks about the, uh, not being able to bring that, an actor back for a callback because they might melt in the room. And it was the first time I heard of that. And I went, oh my God, that's so brilliant. That's exactly where you watch the actor melting. And our responsibility, now I'm talking about me as an actor, me as a voiceover actor, when I have a client and that client needs me to do something, it is my job. Just like if I hired you or someone was hiring me to paint this wall green behind me, it is that person's job to do the paint job. And that's why I always talk about the three pillars of a successful acting career, which is your acting training, your business steps, but also the core work, because we need to get all three of those going. So uh, something I'm really interested in hearing you respond to, there are a number of questions that sort of hit similar things. And if you don't mind, I'm just going to give you a few points that I think your work would be particularly hit. Sure, sure, go for um, it. Someone mentioned like freezing up when the camera light goes on. So hold on to that thought for a minute. Someone else mentioned total blanking of the mind. And someone else mentioned complete overwhelm when there's so much to do so many tasks, including putting themselves on tape that they can't even see straight. And I asked all those questions of you together because I, I sort of think they're one and the same in, a, in an odd way, perhaps. Yeah. Or not. I mean, well, well, in that people are running their thing, right? So whatever, mm. what, whatever way that, that that shows up. And this is where subjectively we all kind of have slightly different takes on what happens for us when we go into those modes, right? So the overwhelm even just the two techniques I shared can really help to take that down, right? That's just overwhelm just needs to breathe a pause and then prioritize, right? Now, I, one of the things I would love to share really quickly uh, is this idea, right? This idea of a copy and a paste. Now, when I work with people and groups, I teach self-hypnosis. And one of my very, I have a New York hypnosis, right? So everything can be done in under a minute, you know, like that. <laughs> that's it. Because I'm used to, you know, working with New Yorkers. So even my hypnosis template is real short. And it's basically going into hypnosis rapidly and then making a movie or stage in your mind. Then you see yourself as you want to be, see yourself doing that role, see yourself doing that thing, see yourself calm, whatever it is. And when you're in a highly suggestible state, you're activating the same neural network as you would once you float into the movie. Mm -hmm. The same regions of the brain are firing off as if you're actually doing it. Mm -hmm. So Olympic athletes know how to do this. You know, sports, they, they, they do this. People recovering from a stroke, they know how to, you know, build back, you know, and, and change their brain through this. It's like the mental rehearsal. And there's a lot of research on that. So for actors, I give them this. It's like a two minute self-hypnosis where they can literally run the audition to the, you know, they can tweak it because they're the director, they're the writer, and they're the actor and the producer. And so they're going to tweak it. They're going to float in and try it on. By the time they get to the stage, or they get to the audition, their unconscious mind is primed. They've already done it. They've already done it successfully time and time again, which really changes the way you walk into any audition because mm. it's, it's been practiced neurologically speaking. So the other thing is one of the key elements there is copy and paste. So if I've got to, you know, walk, open a door and walk through to an audition, 
in my mind, I'm going to think to myself, how do I want to feel? Right. What I always do is elongate this movie to I've already got the part, because if you all knew that when you walked out of that audition, everyone was high fiving that they found the person that they want to play the role. If you Mm -hmm. imagined that you had foresight or the future you whispered in your ear and said they fucking love you, then wouldn't you walk through the door differently Mm -hmm. if you knew they were going to love you? So I have people practice going to the tail end success Mm -hmm. and then bring copying that in their body. It's got to be embodied, right? Suzanne, feel what it feels like when you're, when you're at the top of your game, put your shoulders back, get into the, the posture of how you want to be and then walk through the door and it's copy and paste, copy and paste. And this is what you rehearse before Mm. you walk into the audition. Even if you don't know my self-hypnosis template, if you, most actors are so good at going in and out of hypnotic states. It's Mm. just, they're naturals at it. So if you literally imagine getting in front of that camera, right? (laughs) When somebody mentioned the Brady Bunch, yeah, Baton Rouge, Cindy. (laughs) Remember that was the episode, (laughs) I'm dating myself. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So, if you rehearse that right to the camera. So I've, I just did this the other day because someone would freeze as soon as the camera would come on or as soon as someone was going to take their picture. So we use that. That was where they were pasting how they wanted to feel. So copy it, embody it, feel how you want to feel. And now imagine the, ca- the camera light goes on, right? Copy and paste copy and paste. And once you do that, you can kind of start to run these simulations and to the brain, they might as well be real. That's the interesting thing. Your brain doesn't always know the difference between a real or an imagined event. That's why method actors get into some trouble, right? <laughs> because their brain really tries it on and then they are it. So You know, so that's one way. The overwhelm is to be able to literally take that breath, right? And I love, Peter, I love what you said that, you know, I might not be responsible for the first thought, but I'm definitely responsible for the second. It's fucking awesome, right? Because that is where your point of power is. Power is. Right. Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes, because what starts that internal conversation could be outside of conscious awareness. Right. So before you know it, you're running this internal dialogue loop. So shift out and shut up. Mm. And then come back in with how you want to feel. Wonderful. Okay, thank you so much. And I've got a Mm -hmm. couple of questions just for you. Two, there are a little bit of opposite questions, but um, but they're both acting related directly. Uh, the first one is regarding um, what happens when you have anxiety mid audition. So let's say you're in the middle of an audition, maybe it started out terrific and then mid audition, suddenly the anxiety comes. That's question one. And the other question is post acting anxiety, meaning that let's say you're doing a, whatever it is, a show, a film, TV, and you've had that initial adrenaline and and you've rocked it and you're awesome. And then here we are in week two, or here we are in that somehow in the come down, it's like, then our minds start to go crazy about now, what do I do now? Now, where do I put my hands now? I, so these are two questions about sort of in different places, but they're almost the same question. It's like mid mid anxiety, uh, mid mid audition and mid show. Right. What happens when anxiety uh, takes over? Um, Mid show uh, is a little bit easier. Mid ang- mid mm. mid audition, I don't know. It certainly happened to me in my life. And the only thing I was told to do at the time by I forget who was to say, "I'm sorry, can I start over?" Oh, great! To just be upfront about it. I don't know if that's the right thing to do, but it sort of seems like the only thing to do. And 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 um, if you can say it without feeling like shit that you've fucked up if you can just say you know i'm sorry i i can i just start over and be fully present that moment of asking 
is already a, a, some revelation about yourself as a human being, I think. I don't know, maybe Peter can speak more to that about, you know, that this is a person who won't necessarily melt in the, in the room or melt in the camera. Yeah. If you screw up, you start again. But yeah. I don't know. I'm not sure about that one. After after the show is over, after performance is over, and then worrying about last right. week was great. I have to do that again. What did right. I do? And there's a there's a I don't know if it's a true story, but a story about um, Laurence Olivier, who uh, he came off a performance of doing I don't know King Lear or some one of those mm. mammoth roles, and he was brilliant. And the whole cast was holding their breath, and they said, "My God, you were brilliant!" And he looked miserable when he came off stage. And they <laughs> said, well, "Larry, you were fantastic." And he said, "I know, but I don't know why." <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, that that's that anxiety. Uh, uh, the mm. only thing the only thing to to say for that, I think, is just to remember that each time is the first time, that mm. each time is a new, that, and that's sort of one of the, one of the joys of theater is that it's mm. not permanent, that it's, thank God, it's not permanent, you know, we get to do it again the and next oh, day. Can I add just yes, a little please. piece that might be interesting to people, what you just please, said, Suzanne, that. that each time is the first time, there is this amazing, uh, psychology researcher named Ellen Langer, L-A-N-G-E-R. And if you watch her video on mindfulness over matter, she does a lot of research on uh, noticing what's new and different, what's new and different. So her form of mindfulness is, is just the opposite of mindlessness. And she trained there's an orchestra, there's salespeople. She trained them mm -hmm. to modify in the most subtle way their line or their speech or the, or the orchestral piece. And to modify it, the, the, the directive was uh, change it so subtly that only you know that you've changed it. And every single audience preferred that version. <laughs> because it's present. So if each night, that's what I would say for mid show, how can uh, you subtly change your performance? Because then you're present and people love it. So it, yeah. it's all about what's new and different. And if you, I mean, Ellen Langer, like Peter, you, you would love her. She's so fucking brilliant, <laughs> yeah. you know, um, and, and so many great tips. She, she, her, her book counterclockwise is just phenomenal mm. someone mm. asked about aging and and memory and and she'll cover that as well so anyway and just one yeah. piece about the the memory you know people have different ways of remembering and a lot of actors tend to be good visualizers and what mm -hmm. i'm going to suggest and what i have done with a lot of people who are having memory issues is imagine you take a picture of the script in your mind Practice reading the script in your mind from a mm. picture of it. In mm. other words, it is, it is when, when brilliant spellers win spelling bees, that's because they, make an, it, they have an image of the word and they're just reading it off. They can read it backwards or forward because they're reading it in their mind. So just want to throw that out there as a possible interesting strategy. Um, so, uh, so Suzanne asked, said, I don't know, you know, uh, Peter, from the casting point of view, there's a couple things I want to say about that. One, that understand that it is not my job as a casting director to validate an actor or your existence on the planet. You were mm -hmm. given a gift and that gift is not for you, it is for all of us. And together mm -hmm. we're in the room trying to figure it out, okay? Right. So mm -hmm. I think that's, a bit, but, and that's where I, I, I feel there isn't enough emphasis to actors. And this is the big thing I teach at Acting Business Bootcamp is, is understanding what your true responsibility as an actor mm. is. And that is not to get me to like you. It's for mm -hmm. you to go in there and do your job. And I hope mm -hmm. that I'm explaining that from a compassionate, yeah. but yet a firm point of view. <laughs> yes, <laughs> because I, I think that's absolutely. so 
You it's, absolutely it's your are. responsibility. Yeah, you know that was, that was beautiful. I feel like that touched upon many more things than we had yeah. even planned, but that I know are extremely valuable. Again, I have such compassion because again, I was the actor trying to get the person to hire me. So I totally get that. But this is the thing. Doing the work on yourself before you get in that room is really crucial. And it can happen quicker than you think. And again, I think that it is about res owning responsibility for your talent. Uh, on behalf of, of the sag After Foundation, I just want to say thank you. Thank you so much for your time, for your gracious responses. Everyone now has a way to contact you if indeed they want to pursue further work. And from all of us, thank you all so much for joining. Um, I know it's been really special for me and for so many of you. Thank you so much. Have a beautiful, beautiful night.